Ladies and gentlemen, would you like to uh, start taking your seats? Well done for struggling through this ghastly weather tonight. I know there are many other people sitting comfortably in, at home with dry feet watching online. So uh, uh, we welcome you, whether you're here in person or watching this stream tonight at the event. It's a real honor and a pleasure tonight to welcome two extraordinary guests for a very creative evening tonight. We've been uh, observing the season of creation, as many churches have, throughout September, and especially with the impending uh, COP26 gathering. It's very much on our minds, the whole environmental issue, and tonight we're delighted to introduce a dialogue between two creative thinkers whose dedication to the environment is beyond question. Uh, David Benjamin Blower describes himself as an apocalyptic folk musician, writer, poet, theologian, and podcaster who holds spaces of grief, hope, and shared learning. And he wants to help us reimagine life, unlearn business as usual, and map alternative futures. And he's going to share with us some of his music and his poetry tonight. And in response to each piece that he offers us, we'll have three uh, pieces of music or poetry, and then a response to each from uh, a guest who truly needs no introduction, Dr. Rowan Williams, former Archbishop of Canterbury, whose uh, dedication to environmental causes is of long standing. In 2018, he was signatory to a letter supporting the launch of Extinction Rebellion, calling for a citizens' assembly to work urgently with scientists to develop a credible plan for rapid total decarbonization of the economy. I know he's just come very quickly from Cambridge where he was taking part in an online uh, meeting with a UN body chaired by the Prime Minister of Barbados who was asking the very relevant question that Bob Marley sang, who will get up and stand up in response to the climate crisis and the other challenges of COVID-19 and poverty in our world today. So we're very grateful that he's taken the time to come out after that busy event to join us tonight. At the end of the evening, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions uh, and to, if you haven't already done so, buy beer brewed right below your feet in our church microbrewery. David will be signing CDs and copies of his book of poetry at the back of church. Uh, quick housekeeping mention as usual, uh, fire exits are on both sides at the back where you came in and opposite. Uh, the toilets are in the Glaston area on the King Henry's Road side of the church. We encourage but don't insist on wearing of masks if you're not having a drink just to look after one another's health and safety. Here at St. Mary's we are striving to obtain permission to place solar panels on our church. We've been working on that for about four years now and we're still not quite there. Uh, the complications are rife but it's part of our Capital Works campaign, Grow the Wonder. Uh, which you'll see advertised here. We're celebrating our 150th anniversary in 2022 as a parish church. And we are so grateful to both Rowan and David for their participation tonight. And we urge you to support our campaign. So now please give a very warm welcome to both of them. good to be here. I'm going to begin with a poem and a song. We all walk into the future backwards because the past is our only reference. I'm a bit louder than I thought. <laughs> <laughs> and only rarely does the present demand that we turn and refer to what stood there ahead of us. present demands that we turn and behold, we will confound it and say no. And any who turn and say what they see, we will no longer break bread with these.
For if we must hit the wall, it's our wish to do so unknowingly. Can we hope for any better ending than this? If only it was so, but we do know we can smell it and we can feel it in our bones. And to suspend our knowing on knowing, we go and hang what we know on the tired bones of those. Scapegoat the wretched of the earth for the judgment that we've piled high against ourselves. And all before creation gives birth to the new things we cannot imagine. And why should we have any right to taste them? And then she will take back from us all her stolen Sabbath's rest. And we will say on that holy day, Amen and yes. Oh, scaffoldless hope, oh, climbing forwards without banisters. If there is any road, into the days beyond the calendars of war. It's by a thread, the circus rope, on which he gazes with disbelief. Through so much woe, so many ghosts, whose faces marked with hard and Streets and towns, hold on to your ground and dig your wells together. You streets and towns, hold each other's shoulders, govern yourselves together. Futures crashing like waves against the breakers. The suits are all stashed in their gold in hidden places. You've guessed the future's benign, you're mistaken, my friends. Oh, angel of time, with frozen eyes, looking back on catastrophes. All stacking up and piling high, and yet yeah, I see you, yes, I see. You'd like to heal and make it right, but your wings are spread out wide. And some ill wind carries you away, off to some future there behind. streets and towns, hold on to your ground and dig your wells together. You streets and towns, hold each other's shoulders, govern yourselves together. Futures crashing like waves against the breakers. Suits are all stashing their gold in hidden places. If you've guessed the future's benign, you're mistaken, my friends. Futures crashing like waves against the breakers. The suits are all stashed in their gold in hidden places. If you've guessed the future's benign, you're mistaken, my friends.
I can't remember which language it is, but there is certainly at least one language in the world which works on the assumption that it's the past which is before us and the future is behind us. And that's the image we've been hearing explored. It's an image which was particularly highlighted by the great German-Jewish Marxist Walter Benjamin in the early 20th century. Picking up an image from uh, the artist Paul Clay, he writes about the angel of history, wings spread, mouth open in horror, moving backwards at a great rate towards the future. Can't see the future. What's in front of the angel is history. Everything that's happened, piling up more and more and more, more and more disasters. The past is in front of you. The future is behind you. The past is what you can see, and the future is what you can't. The result of that is that we can, like the angel, simply be frozen with open mouth and open eyes. What do we see? We see the accumulation of horror, the accumulation of failure, because that's what history is. But a friend of mine who was a great psychoanalyst used to say that one of the most important lines for him in Shakespeare was a line from The Tempest. What seest thou else? What seest thou else? Are we capable of seeing something other than the past? It's a tricky one, because how can we possibly turn our heads and see the unseeable future? How do we move out of that default setting of just looking back and thinking, well, that's how it is, that's how things are, that's how it will be? There'll be more about what that might entail a bit later as we think together about what comes out of that. But for now, sticking for a moment with that sobering and rather bleak image, something which I'm hearing coming through what David's been sharing with us is the key difference between complaint and lament. Between complaint, which just says, this is terrible, which just allows itself to be frozen, which just allows itself to take for granted that what has been the past that's there in front of us is what is real and what is lasting. Complaint, how should we not? That's all we can see, that's all there is. All we can do is cry out. But what about lament? In the Bible, lament is something a bit different. Lament is protest, and protest says, this is not how it has to be. Lament has its edge and its depth in something elusive that is more than just the past we can see. And it's one of those areas, isn't it, where Christians particularly have a rather unusual take on stuff. Because here we are, day by day and week by week, telling a story from the past, a story which is nothing if not a story of loss, pain, and terror, and saying, actually, that is in some mysterious way our key to the future we can't see. Somehow, in that story ahead of us in the past, that story of the humiliation and death and rejection of God's representative, somewhere in that is a future so that gives us, you might say, authority to lament, to say no. There it is in front of us, but no, that's not it. 
You could say faith is very much not believing what's in front of your eyes. If what's in front of your eyes is the past of pain and failure, then part of what faith means is saying, what's in front of my eyes is not it. There is something else, something we discovered, and the edge, the ache, the force, and the anger of lament is part of that. The next poem I want to do was um, inspired by um, a book by Timothy Morton, uh, the philosopher Timothy Morton, called Being Ecological, and he talks about living in a time of mass extinction. Um, but he points to a bizarre example, um, the film The Thing. Have you ever seen the horror film The Thing? Um, and uh, all sorts of terrible things happen. It's, um, it's kind of sci-fi horror. Um, but at one point, things get so bad that somebody just bursts into laughter. And I guess he's feeling out that moment at which emotionally processing um, times of great weight flips into another kind of space um, than just the initial um, horror or panic or frozenness. And so will we fall through all our troubled sleep and awaken to panic, guilt and dread. And then shall we fall through the floor once more and then into tears and laughter instead. And wonder and sorrow over everything there is, how much it matters in ecstatic clarity and madness. And every thread of this dread comedy of foolishness that we really existed, and we really did this. And nothing can be undone, only tended and forgiven. And then shall we open our small clenched fists and hold out palms of powerless thankfulness for everything that we received was gift and so much love and wonder in our midst. And finally, stand we all in defeat or and everything that was and is and shall be evermore. If the earth should change and the hills should break, for is burn, her face turn ashen, and the stones should fall, and the waves reach tall, and the shaken soil slides in the ocean. There is a river, and it sings.
if the black gold burns and the wheel yet turns and the state keeps friends who pillage in violence if the feet should roam and your gut turns stone and the tears unknown shall long for silence there is a river and it sings and it runs beneath all things there is a river and it sings A Buddhist story. The man's running away from a tiger. Looming up ahead of him is a cliff edge. He scrambles over the edge of the cliff, and fortunately, there's a little ledge about three feet down. He manages to insert himself onto the ledge, clinging on to some tree roots sticking out the side of the cliff. The ledge begins to crumble underneath him, and the roots begin to come away from the cliff edge. Right ahead of him, in a little niche, there are two small flowers. The man looks at them and says, my god, that's beautiful. That's enlightenment. <laughs> In the middle of the disaster, something is seen. Something which is timeless, not in the sense of being abstract, but in the sense of not being vulnerable to how things go, good or bad. There is a river. There is something flowing steadily, which is not going to be shattered, diverted, exhausted, used up by our own failure and our own suffering. There is, at the heart of reality, a direction. It doesn't mean that the, you know, there is a meaning to history in the simple sense that it's all going to turn out well. It may or it may not. But there is a reality, something that just is. I'm always quoting King Lear on things like this, but there's that moment where Leo can't quite believe his daughter is dead at the end of the play, and thinks for a moment that she's still alive and says, if this be so, it is a chance that doth redeem all sorrows else that I have felt. It's not that it's just a, a happy ending, but somehow a vision makes it all bearable, makes it all livable with, you see into the heart of something. This is it. And that's why, in the world we're in, faced with tigers and cliff edges in, you know, considerable quantity, there is no gulf, no schism between the disciplines of action and the disciplines of looking, between acting and contemplating, if you like. Contemplation, the discipline of patiently, self-forgettingly looking into the heart of things, that tells us that that relationship with the real is, what should we say, simply worthwhile. That's where we belong. And out of that confidence of vision, we become free for a certain kind of action. 
not action that is constantly calculating, you know, is this going to work or not, because if it's not going to work, I might as well stop. But the kind of action that goes on patiently saying, this is worth it, this is true, this is real. And I'm free from worrying about how it's going to land. Obviously, you do your, you do your risk assessments, you do your planning, you use your mind. But the doing of it, the worthwhileness of the doing of it, doesn't depend on how things turn out. You do it. And the mysterious thing is that that kind of doing, that kind of acting, can go deeper and work more transformingly than any amount of anxious busyness. The river that flows beneath everything, the flower blooming in that crevice on the cliff face, the sudden perception that a relationship with a beloved face is what matters most in the whole world, and never mind whatever else happens. All of this sets us free. The heart is opened up. The mind goes on clenching, fretting, running around on its hamster wheel. But the heart opens. And what we've been hearing is about the heart opening. Faced with what we're faced with, in terms of climate crisis, and in terms of all that we were talking about earlier, the accumulation of horror through history, how easy to be paralyzed. And yet, those most deeply and lastingly invested in action about this and many other things seem so often to be the ones who've looked into the center, who've said, well, that remains true. No one can touch that. Often quoted, meeting a great hero of mine many years ago, Bayas Nordi, the South African anti-apartheid activist, listening to him talk about what it was like living through the years of his house arrest, the death threats, the harassment, all the other things, and remembering how he shrugged and said, well, there comes a point where they can't touch you. You know that this is real. And if you're in touch with it, you're real. And out of that comes the action. Out of that comes the hope. Because against all likelihood, something has turned out to be possible. Because at the heart of things is what doesn't go away and what doesn't depend on you. How extraordinary that the realization that not everything depends on you releases you to do things. Because sometimes, ring any bells, sometimes the feeling that everything depends on you can totally freeze you, totally depress you. But what if things were different? Then you can ask, what's possible and what can I make possible? This is the last part of a poem. This part's called Eskerton. On the threshold, the doorway of the present, departing from the past, entering the future. Right now, you go to enter. You breathe and lift your foot right now, and again, right now, and again, and again. Now is the messianic moment in which we may enter the realm of possibility, the realm of redemption. This is sacred. This is holy ground. Take off your shoes as you enter, and enter knowingly and purposefully. Here is holiness. See the burning trees that do not burn. See the abandoned towers. Hear the unnumbered languages. Hear God's voice in the languageless infant. Hear wisdom amidst her creaking trees. See the burned out chariots and spears and the rewilded horses. Hear the songs indigenous. Smell the heady herbs. 
be held in the gaze of ancient indigeneity, which is looking mercifully upon your power as your self-defeating conceit, and then looks at you, your scene, you, with no map, your one gold earring, and no shoes on your feet. in the soil, feel the groan, feel the joy, all sit with the hurt, stare into the dirt, occupy the bandstands, gather lost seasons, climb down your pyramids, relinquish your privileges, welcome strangers to your table as though they were angels, sit with the spent the lament, break your vows to the powers, plant trees and grow flowers, share the resources, free all the horses. All citizens, put your hands in the soil and feel the grow. Down by the riverside, who's not afraid to die? Emerge from the waves, tore loose from the powers of the age. Live now as citizens of what's left of the age to come. Behold the Messiah die for the lands we're crucified. Break bread and take drink, all feel and think. Shed tears every day. For everything we throw away, mourn for your families, mourn for your enemies, sing to the stars, behold our grieving hearts. All citizens, put your hands in the soil and fill. joy and be still and be still put your hand to your mouth let your pride go south put your hand on your head make terms with the dead put your hand on your heart can we stop what we start put your hand on your face too late to learn from our mistakes. Sisters to the leverage, brothers to the edges, youth to the fore. This bleak future is yours. All ye of noble birth, join the scum of the earth. Gather around the powerless, for theirs is the power that can save us. look at what's in front of us, the history we've inherited. We can feel at first that what we see is that mountain of failure and suffering. And what if the light changes? 
Not the story, not the things that have happened, not the real history of pain, but the light, which picks out things we hadn't noticed, which allows us to read that whole story just a little differently. Enlightenment, that moment of breakthrough, that allows us to see from that slightly different angle, almost imperceptibly different, and yet the light has shifted, the shadows fall a bit differently, the contours are just a little different. We see what we hadn't seen. We see where things have been made possible in spite of everything. And so we wonder, and we can't do more than wonder, we wonder what it is in our own lives as individuals or as societies that might become visible in a different light. One of the tough questions about climate crisis in the future is the question of what we think we're handing on to our children and grandchildren and what we want to. If only we say, I say, if only we could be certain we were handing on a safe, sustainable world. We go on hoping and praying for that. But what if part of what we're handing on is simply the memory of people who refused to accept that crisis was natural, that injustice was built into the world? What if what we want to hand on is what some theologians like to call a subversive memory? Perhaps at times we act, we think, we try to intervene in the world's crises just in that modest hope. Perhaps somebody will look back and say, well, somebody thought it could be different. And that's not nothing. On the contrary, that is part of the opening up of a world whose surfaces can seem sealed. That can be one of the things we can pass on to a newer generation. Another name for that is living and acting sacramentally. The sacrament in our Christian thinking isn't something that miraculously changes everything. The sacrament is a moment of shifted perspective on our relationships and the stuff of our world in which, for a moment, just as the perspective shifts, we see it could be seen quite differently. There's a depth to this I hadn't known. The shadows fall differently. The contours look different. The sacrament is a moment of vision, of possibility, of opening. And when we, fed by the sacramental life of the Christian community, when we seek to act in hope, when we seek not just to put our hands in the soil, but to become soil for growth, we're acting sacramentally. We are saying, here's the stuff of my life, all its weakness, all its fragility, but can it be a story out of which something will grow for others? Who knows, but I put it in God's hands with that prayer. And then, what is there left? To be still, to be still. Shall we take just a few moments to be still, to feel the joy and be still?
David and Father Owen, you've given us such a rich, uh, image-laden evening of contemplative uh, possibilities. It may be hard to find words to respond, but there may be things people would like to ask or comment on, and um, Emily's going to bring the microphone around if anybody would like to, uh, to ask a question of either of our guests or make a comment. I've got a very interesting question, and it's about making sacrifices. It's, is it that we have to say farewell to big motor car engines and eating meat regularly, like things like Thanksgiving and Christmas? I'm afraid we may just have to do it in a veggie or vegan way, and say goodbye to beautiful old petrol motor mobiles and do you agree that that is the thing we just have to do? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, seriously, I think we are locked into addictive patterns very often with food, consumption, travel, and it's so hard to break them. You know, I, I, I speak from inside the difficulty. Trying this last summer um, to travel in Europe by train without using any flights, you know, takes a bit of planning, takes longer. And um, in some countries, the train service creates enormous frustrations. OK, it's not the end of the world. And slowing down surely is part of this. The problem is, just one last thought on that, the problem is, it's, again, it's fatally easy for this to become a new kind of um, weaponized morality, finger-wagging, top-down, um, elites telling the unfortunate peasantry what they ought to be doing. It's got to be something we talk about in free and open ways, not just in our own echo chambers and our own bubbles. And that's, that's hard work and it slows things down, but it does mean if you do get change, it's change that's owned a bit more. I was thinking of in the future whether putting art exhibitions for the church, would, it, would be a good way, it would be a good way of bringing awareness to the place. And I'm also an artist as well. I think that's a brilliant thing to do. Um, so much of the change that needs to happen, um, well, we need change on many levels. One is matters of individual choice. Another is systemic change, uh, change on the, uh, on the greatest um, uh, levels of power. Um, but I was speaking to the climate scientist, Kevin Anderson, and he talks about a middle space um, that joins up to both of those ends, our individual choices, the, the choices that the powers that be make. Um, and that space is made up of communities reimagining life together, communities in dialogue, um, and Art is such a powerful and important way that we um, communicate with one another and reimagine um, how the pieces that we have in our hands could be uh, put together differently. So I think that's a beautiful idea. Yeah. Will God allow man to destroy the earth where where we can't see what's before us, going backwards, looking forward, will God intervene at some time to prevent humanity destroying the earth? I don't know a short answer to that because 
what God will do is not something I have access to in that sense. What, what, I, what I believe is that God is faithful to what God has made. And the way in which God intervenes is, of course, in lives of faith and love. If we take seriously the pattern of Jesus' life and death and resurrection, God doesn't work by, as it were, poking a finger down from outside, but by transforming from the, from the center, from the heart. So you and I are part of God's intervention. And that's what we know today and tomorrow. That's what I think we have to respond to. Um, it, would be, it would be comforting to think that God would somehow not allow the human creatures that God loves so deeply to disappear. And yet our freedom is such that that's one of the things God has put into our hands. So when Moses says to the people of Israel, or says on God's behalf to the people of Israel, behold, behold today I set before you life and death, that's, you know, that's where we are. Hi. Um, I really loved what you said about um, <clears throat> when you don't know what, whether, what the outcome of something is going to be, but you just do it. And often, and my experience in the last um, few, well, year and a half, has been doing things because I felt they were important, but not knowing what the outcome was going to be, but finding that different outcomes happened, which have been really good and, and sort of stirred other things to happen as a result. I'm just saying this because I, I write music for children and adults about climate change, not first of all, it was all about imagination to begin with, but in the last few years it's all been about, because I feel that that is a way of just getting people's attention. And I work with children in nurseries and sing these songs and we have little discussions and they tell their parents and the parents tell me. And I just think all the little, like you were saying from below and from above, I'm a below person and I just try to do things in my own little world that can make a difference. And the reason I came here tonight was really to connect with some people that have the same vision because I can't find them always. And, um, but just having conversations, having all different kinds of different art, music, drama, I feel are the, the key to, to moving people and making them feel different poetry. And we're doing something tomorrow with poetry. So please, you know, I'd love to connect with lots of people through here and keep that moving. Because I believe that from, from talking to everyday people and making those connections is the only way really to, to, to change people's minds. Sorry, that was probably too much, but anyway. Not a bit, thanks, <laughs> thanks very much. Um, just to say, yes, of course, if you don't, Sorry. A few things will be really, really good to do around here, especially if you want to bring awareness about climate change, is that if we were to do like talks and stuff, it would be really good to get people who are students to do a talk so we could bring people of all ages to come along. And what has been really lacking around here is that, you, it's that young people being part of the community seem to be really, really lacking, and it would be really good for them to take part and do the talk and maybe kids from schools will be a good part to do the talk about climate change? One of the really encouraging things I've seen in the last couple of years, of course, is school students stepping up to the plate. The school strikes, the young people there as activists, it's been transforming, you're quite right. And we need more of it. But just to, on the previous point, David and I have something to say on this. Um, I think that when we do something without foreclosing what the result has got to be, what we do is set off little chains of reaction which we haven't predicted, which have a kind of multiplier effect. And if we're not too tight about controlling the outcomes, that may be one of the things that just spreads in just the way you, you describe. And the arts are part of that. David. Um, yeah, no, I don't think I have anything to add. That's um, well, I, I suppose there's, there's two sides of it for me. There's the things that we know that we've got to do, um, and that's, those are not easy. We don't necessarily know how to do those things or how to not do those things, but th there's things that we know. Then there's things that we, um, that we don't know, um, and that's troubling and exciting, but we're, we're in a space of... Um, 
trying possible, possible um, uh, alternative futures. We're creating images together of what other futures might be. Um, there's something obviously massively disturbing about living at a time when the, um, the structures we live in are found wanting and cannot, uh, cannot ca they're, they're not an arc that can carry us into the future. There, there's something doomed about the way that we, um, uh, well, the, the powerful human beings of the world, um, which in a sense is mostly us in this room, um, have built the world. It's disturbing to see the end of that. And we, in a way, we're sort of in a time of mourning and having a funeral for a world that can't continue. But then there's something exciting, there's something messianic about the task of coming together and exploring possibilities. Um, not ones we know about, these are the things we don't know. You know. Um, uh, but that's exciting, isn't it? Um, dreaming together. Um, the best vision of the world that we, that we can. Um, and we'll have many different visions um, and beginning to take the next step and the next step and the next step towards those images. That's something that's beautiful about living in terrible times. We've got, we've got two questions from people who are watching the live stream this evening. One of them is for David and it says, in the video of the soil, there is an arm with a Hebrew tattoo. Is that your arm? Is that your tattoo? And if so, what does it mean and why did you have it tattooed on you? <laughs> not, my, not my tattoo. Um, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Rome's tattoo. <laughs> um, that's my friend um, Sam's tattoo. Um, and I believe it, the word is Adama, the Hebrew word um, Adama. Um, which I believe is just soil. Yep. I think the name, right. Is that right? Soil, earth, yeah. So, there, there, I mean, there's an interesting... Um, and the uh, song is called The Soil, so that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? The song is called The Soil. I guess it resonates with what, uh, what Rowan's talked about, not just putting our hands in the soil, but becoming soil. Um, there's the word for humanity, uh, soil. Remembering, that, I mean, that, that's literally what we're made of. Uh, and what we go back to. And um, I think my friend Sam, he's, he's obsessed with soil, actually. He's got um, buckets full of worms creating soil everywhere you go, um, and all sorts of other disturbing ways that he's cultivating good soil, because that's, um, that's what gives us what we need to live. Um, uh, but rekindling relationship with, uh, with what we're made of, is um, there's something important about that. We have a question for Rowan on, from online as well. It says, what, if anything, can the church do in order to help the nations of the world see themselves primarily as custodians of the earth rather than competing nations? We can certainly work at getting our own house in order. We can ask, and I hope answer and act on the answer, we can ask about what it is in our own lives as religious communities that push us into rivalries, zero-sum games, and all the sort of power fantasies that still afflict us as, as a church. We can, I suppose we can demonstrate at local level that there can be effective corporate commitment, not just individual, eco-churches and so on, eco-synagogues and the like, all of that. And then there's just the you know, frustrating, ongoing job of trying to, trying to say what it is that our humanity is really about in words, in actions, in signs. And yes, uh, it's, it's brutally difficult because the investment in our unnatural and dysfunctional and addictive practices is so deep, it's, it's um, there's, there's a, a word sometimes used for this, um, quite a little word, I think it's, I think it's sin or something like that. <laughs> I think we just have one more question from John here and then we'll call it a night. Um, hello, hello. 
Um, there's a heck of a lot of stuff that's come up. Um, and the, um, this needs serious looking at. Um, and lots of things get pulled out, like can I have a car or can we change and get technology such as having a electric car rather than, think, rather than saying that do we need to, how can we run society? So when I was a child, <coughs> 70 years ago, over in Chelsea, people lived where they worked, basically. They had odd ones that had cars, rarely used them because there was no need. So these things can be done. I do have my memories of these things. And um, we see that in this last year or so when they're talking about the pandemic. Well, what do we do if we get children, what with the children? If the children don't go to school, then they're having all of these mental illnesses, or these mental problems. And it just gets left there. The fact is children don't have mental illnesses because they don't go to school. There can be changes in how we go about it rather than just forcing them back into school. Um, which only educates them for a certain form of society that we are already in, which isn't working. That is the whole point. And so you can't just pick out these little bits and pieces and say, well, carbon or something else like that. You know, the mining communities. And somebody said earlier, you know, we are the custodians of the earth. You, could, you can think about it like that, but we are part of this great big whole, not whole, a whole, we're part of this, we are not separate from, mm -hmm. um, and as you know, I to say as you know, I'm sure you do, Leonardo Boff, when he's writing about the um, liberation theology, um, think book of his about 20, 30 years ago, talking about the poor actually come out of this so badly, they are, they are not given what they need and it's, you know, they, they can't live a free life and that's not because it's not possible, it's because some people won't allow it and they want other things. And that is a major difficulty that we have when we're looking about these things. And like when, I mean, that young girl you talked about, the student, what is it, Greta Thunberg, she came up with exactly these things the other day. Question. Okay, pardon? Have you got a question? No, oh, sorry. What, so, what do you think about the idea of that? How do you feel, then, that we can go towards... Because you said, you know, um, we... Uh, and when we say we, obviously, there's lots of different sections of society, lots of different views that are going on, and we do not live together as a whole community. Thanks for that. What do I think about it? <laughs> that's, a, that's a brilliant way of ending it. <laughs> um, just, just quickly... Um, and, and, and very practically, and it relates to, to an earlier question, you talked about um, patterns of car usage, that sort of thing, about children going to school, about so, all sorts of stuff. Two things which, again, church communities and other religious communities could do more of. Do we think, as church communities, about um, supporting a carpool in our community? sharing transport costs and so forth to reduce usage. It's a very simple thing. Um, we have, in Cardiff, where I live at the end of the road, there is a, a carpool center where people in that part of the, the city can um, sign up to share costs and usage of petrol to reduce that. Then, secondly, the church has a big investment in education. Is the church prepared to challenge some of the models of education that we're inheriting, the ones that produce, as you say, the, the narrow outcomes, the, the rather shrunken expectations of just getting children ready for one kind of society? Or is the church prepared to be on the front foot with saying, we have to rethink this, we have to imagine education as the production of question-asking citizens, not cogs in the wheel? But lots more I could say, but thank you. I'd just like to um, uh, draw attention back to the thing you said about, um, well, the language of stewardship. That's helpful language, I guess, that moves us um, away from language of domination, dominating nature, um, um, 
torturing nature to get nature to give up her secrets, as Francis Bacon put it. We go to the language of stewardship, but I think you, were, you seem to be making the point that the language of stewardship still separates us out from nature. Yes. yes. Um, and um, I think that's part of our problem. Beginning to make different choices as individuals, as communities, um, and to, um, to force, as well as we can, change from the powers that be, um, is a way of doing something more profound, which is changing our understanding of who and what we are, um, healing ourselves of this breach we've made between ourselves and everything else, because, you know, we're all, it, it's all creation. We also are creation. We're all the same stuff. Yes, we're all nature. We're all nature, yes, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so thank you for uh, putting your finger on that. The conversations have really started now, and I'm sure they'll continue at the back of church as we perhaps have another drink before we leave or uh, look at the books and CDs. Um, I'm going to go away from tonight with a very strong abiding image of rowing backwards on that beautiful river <laughs> into the future, but looking uh, in a really contemplative way into the heart of things. It's a, it's a wonderful image, and I am grateful for all the images you've given us tonight, all the sense of hope in the midst of lament, uh, and the call to action, which is not divorced from that contemplative looking. So thank you so much, both of you, for a very rich evening, and let's show our appreciation to both David and Mark.